38 years is a long time for anyone, but it was an especially long time for the sick man featured in this morning's gospel story. In fact, it was about a decade longer than the average life expectancy of people in first century Palestine. So the man had literally lived a lifetime with his illness. We don't really know any details about his illness. If you're like me, you may have assumed he was paralyzed since he was unable to make his way to the water. But the Greek word for his condition is simply translated as weakness. All we really know is he's had this weakness a really long time, long enough that it has become a part of his identity, long enough that he's probably even acquired a bit of seniority among the other sick people who gather each day at the legendary pool of Bethesda in hopes of a healing miracle. The story begins behind the pool's healing properties was that an angel would periodically stir up the water in the pool. And once the water was stirred up, whoever was the first person to make it into the water was cured of their infirmity. But it was only a one-person miracle. Everyone else had to wait until the next stirring up of the pool. This was the legend behind the Pool of Bethesda, which translated means House of Mercy. House of Mercy for some, maybe, but not for this man who had spent the last 13,879 days of his life hoping for a cure to whatever it was that ailed him. 13,879 days and counting. Something tells me he had actually given up hope, always close enough to witness one healing after another, but never able to experience the healing in his own life. And so there he sat each day, maybe even entertaining some of the others with the stories of the miraculous things he had witnessed over the years at the pool, ending each story with a heavy sigh and downcast eyes, because he was pretty sure he would never experience a healing for himself. But as tragic as all this may sound, it really wasn't such a bad life if you thought about it. He had a fixed schedule, knowing where he would be each day. He was surrounded by other people who had become a sort of family to him. In fact, his long years at the pool probably gave him a more or less patriarchal status with his family of choice. Sure, he had to sacrifice a bit of his freedom. Okay, a lot of his freedom. But there was something to be said for the security of a daily routine and the attention he received from others who pitied him. There was something to be said for that. I think there are people today who make sacrifices in their lives because they too believe they have no choice about the matter. There's the person in the wheelchair who hardly ever gets out of the house because it's just not worth the trouble trying to maneuver in a world that's made for people who are able to walk and climb stairs. There's the retiree who never enjoys the things she or he had always hoped they would enjoy because their income is limited, their health is failing, and their life is filled with many more obligations than they ever imagined they would have. And there's the LGBT person who misses out on a love relationship because they are afraid they will lose their job or their family's approval if they live and love authentically and openly. There's the workaholic who staggers to the end of each day exhausted and who has no social life because everything depends on them making deadlines. And there's the person who is afraid to dream of a better life because the only thing they have ever known is multi-generational poverty. Each of them sacrifice a bit of the freedom and happiness that comes with a fully lived life of optimism and hope. But at least they have the security that comes with the daily routines which wall them off from unexpected surprises, rejection, and vulnerability. 
What may have started out as despair for them has evolved into a way of life, one which they've come to accept as the cross they must bear. This may have been the sort of thoughts that circled and swirled their way through the head of the man in our story when, out of the blue, they were interrupted by the words, Do you want to be healed? Did he want to be healed? What kind of question is that? Of course he wanted to be healed. Do you think he enjoyed sitting here, day in and day out, cut off from the rest of society? Don't you think he would much rather be climbing hills and running through the meadows? Of course he wants to be healed, but it's not his fault. It's his condition that keeps him from getting to the pool. But do you want to be healed? That's just what I'm trying to tell you. I'm not able to be healed because I'll be trampled underfoot as the other stampede to the pool once the water is stirred up. But do you really want to be healed? Look, it's not my fault that no one is willing to help me to the pool. If you really want to be healed, then stand up. Quit your whining. Leave off with blaming everyone else. Stop playing the victim of circumstances. Your weakness is not an inability to walk. It's the illusion that you are trapped and have no choice. Stand up and walk, and take that mat with you while you're at it. Which translated means, shut the door behind you on your way out. I don't believe the miracle in this story is that a man who had been unable to walk for 38 years could all of a sudden walk. I believe the miracle was that the man discovered that he had a choice between despair and hope. But it was his decision. He could live out his days imprisoned by the emptiness of a life of his own choosing, or he could rise above his despair and live in hope. And we have the same choice. Overwhelmed by the cruelty of life, we can turn out the lights, lock the door, and turn off our phones while we sit by the window looking out as the world passes us by. We can try to fill the emptiness of the hole in our lives with overeating and binge drinking. We can medicate our feelings with any number of drugs. We can blame God for our circumstances and blame others for their refusal to help us in our hour of need. We may even convince ourselves that we have no choice in the matter. We are trapped, and unless someone else shows us what to do, we are doomed to this life of despair. Or we can rise above it and embrace hope as a way of life. We can take responsibility for our, our lives and our happiness. We can choose to live. We can decide that God is on our side and not against us. We can quit expecting God to stir up the waters of life so that we will be magically cured of our predicaments. And we can quit expecting others to come to our rescue. In other words, we can stand up on our own two feet and we can take our mat with us while we're at it. There is a story in the book of Deuteronomy how Moses stood before the people of Israel after they had spent 40 years wandering in the desert wilderness. A lifetime of aimless wandering was all that most of them had ever known. Moses was nearing the end of his own life and he had just presented to them all the instructions which God had laid out for them. Behind them lay a vast wasteland and before them, right across the Jordan River, lay the promised land flowing with milk and honey. And these are the words Moses spoke to them. This law that I give to you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you need to ask yourselves who will go up to heaven for us and bring it down to us so that we may hear it and keep it. Nor is it beyond the seas, so that you need to wonder who will cross the seas for us 
and bring it back to us so that we may hear it and keep it. No, the Word of God is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you can keep it. Today I have set before you life and success or death and disaster. I have set before you life or death, blessing or curse. Choose life then so that you and your descendants may live. Every day Jesus sets before us a similar choice. We are given a choice between hope and despair. For the love of God and the sake of your soul, stand up and choose hope that you may live. Amen.